We're doing something a little bit different for our live at the Brentwood show today. I am going to be giving up my host role in favor of a guest role. We did something like this last year. I guess it's becoming sort of an annual tradition here during the Saratoga meet during our live at the Brentwood shows. So I'm gonna stop talking. You're gonna hear Ace freely, and then the next voice you hear uh, will be that of my good friend, Bernie Corbett from the Games People Play podcast, a show you all should be absolutely checking out on iTunes or wherever you get your shows. We'll, we'll probably find a way to talk about that a little bit later. But uh, anyway, here's Ace. Back in the New York group. And whenever you're ready. Good guest. Okay. Andy? Welcome, everybody. And uh, wanna, once again, uh, in the spirit of 70s sitcoms, a little bit of a crossover here. We're in, we're in the money to the games people play, uh, the Jeffersons, all in the family. Uh, happy days, Laverne and Shirley, and of course, Fish and Bonnie Miller. Uh, all great crossovers from the 70s. We're doing one here in the uh, pandemic summer of 2020. With, as he mentioned, I'll stay socially distanced, my good friend Pete Fornatel. Uh, great to be back. I think we, uh, we began this tradition, and we can't have too many traditions in the summer of 2020 that we try to keep alive, along with hope. Uh, but uh, I think we did it the day of the Whitney last year, Pete, when I had a chance to kind of turn the tables and, and interview you. So, great to be back with you. Fantastic to have you. Your visits are always a, a great pleasure. You've been for many Travers in a row. We broke that streak this year. Did. But it's good to be back here at the Brentwood, and I'm excited to yap with you about whatever you... I, I saw you furiously writing notes. I don't often get to be the guest. I'm really enjoying the chance to get to answer the questions instead of ask them here today. I'm, I'm a little lost. I didn't bring my William F. Buckley clipboard, but I can still give some very pensive looks at you during this interview <laughs> with my prop. So you, one thing we learned from William F. Buckley, as long as you have the pen, you can say just about anything. But uh, I thought once again, because of the, uh, the unique and uh, rather bizarre uh, Twilight Zone qualities of this summer, I keep looking for Rod Sterling coming out from behind that edge over here at the Brentwood. <laughs> Uh, to really, I think, a good starting point, uh, the, the folks that know you on your program, obviously. Uh, Pete has executed a little bit of an escape from New York on his own, Kurt Russell, 1981, uh, from Brooklyn to Saratoga, and, and this has been, obviously, uh, uh, a, a big leap for you and your family to, to relocate up here at the time that you did, and looks like for the foreseeable future you're going to be here for a while. That's the plan as of now. A lot's gonna depend on what happens very specifically with Perrin's school, but it looks like they'll eventually be going back every other week, but they're easing into it. So as of now, my best guess is we'll get to stay here through at least the first three weeks of September, which is exciting to me. Uh, I've done big stretches of time up here before, but this will be the biggest one. We came up in whatever it was, uh, mid, early to mid June, and it's good. It's been it's been nice to get a chance to be a little bit more part of the community. I meet, met a lot of people through Kim Weir and the work we've done for the Third Red Retirement Foundation, and it, it is starting to feel more like home up here as opposed to second home, which is kind of cool. And of course, you mentioned uh, your daughter Perrin and uh, lovely young lady, <laughs> and uh, you're also now, as many parents uh, across the uh, the sweep of the pandemic, involved with homeschooling. I just know one story for a friend of mine back in Boston, where I'm from. Uh, he got on the phone one day, he was supposed to be doing an interview in one of my programs, and I said, Mike, how's things going up there? He said, I can't do third grade math. That's how things are going. So I know you've been experiencing some of that now as uh, this whole homeschooling experience. How's that going for you? Oh, it's been one of the great challenges of my life, but also a great pleasure. It's, it's a weird dichotomy. Getting to spend so much time with her is something that I'm always going to remember and cherish and is, is great on a certain level, but it, it's also just the, the, the daily grind of it. Well, and the challenge for me is trying to teach, you know, she's in a, a Spanish language program, and trying to teach that piece of the curriculum as a non-Spanish speaker, like give me the math and science all day long, I can handle that. Um, trying to you know teach her how to conjugate verbs is another another matter um i've gotten to where i can understand spanish a lot better than, than i once did um <laughs> but I, I still uh, need a little bit of work on my own to to get back up to speed and we'll be well, i'll have my chance this fall in, indeed you will and any uh, pay raises for teachers i'm sure you'll be oh, showing in favor yeah. you and susan your wife will be raising <laughs> your hands in, in unison on that one <laughs> that's for sure a little bit of a different appreciation for that 
Uh, obviously, you know, everything, it, it really is to uh, quote one of our favorite shows uh, with uh, Seinfeld, we are in the bizarro world. Uh, the triple crown of racing is no exception when you consider that uh, the Belmont, the longest, another one of our annual traditions broken this year. We can only hope 2021 will bring us back. But uh, the whole dynamic, Pete, of the triple crown and how this is shaping up and uh, the fact that, uh, well, it's a great tradition, the Kentucky Derby, the first Saturday in September, you know. <laughs> Uh, with what's to come, but your perspective on that. It's so weird, and it's doubly weird with having who looks like such a special horse uh, in position to make a run at this thing. Um, Tis the Law has just been unbelievable. It might have actually been that. could have even been that same day. I, I, I can't remember who the other guest was the day that you were here, but at one point last summer we had Maggie Wolfendale on the show, and we were talking about two-year-olds who had impressed her to that point. And it was, you know, the, the Barkley Tag Constitution cult there that went the other day. It looked really, really good. I know it's a New York bread, but it looked really, really good. Yeah, he's really, really good. And the other thing I've been saying is just as we had to come up with a term for American Pharaoh and his accomplishment of winning the three Triple Crown races and then going on to win at the Breeders' Cup, we might have to come up with a, with a five-legged version of that if this horse fulfills the potential and goes on to... Uh, to not only win the Derby, but then potentially the Preakness and the Classic. It's it's everything's on the table for this guy. He is a freak mm. in all the right ways. And Barkley Tag says he's never even seen him tired yet. So maybe he has the the bandwidth the, the, to get through the rest of the season. It's horse racing. Things change so quickly and all the time. But I, I, I for me, I'm less now focused on the weirdness of the the order being switched around than right. I am just thrilled at being able to follow this horse's story and just so spoiled since uh, Matt Bernier and I started this show back in 2014. The list of horses we've gotten yeah. to see yeah. run between California Chrome and Arrogate and American Pharaoh and Justify and it feels like Tis the Law belongs on that list and, and may yet, I mean who knows, but may yet go on to accomplish uh, uh, some things uh, the equal if not uh, superior of what some of those you know, others have done. That's right, may, may even surpass it which is pretty amazing mentioned uh, about not being tired and already is run because of the schedule the long one has already been run so you wonder what uh, well they switched it this year yeah. and that's going to be a that's going to be a bone of contention mm -hmm. the belmont the 2020 belmont they made a mile and an eighth so even if he goes on and does what i just said and runs the table there'll be those who said ah he never he, he never had the mile and a half. but mm -hmm. i mean you yep. watch the way the horse runs he comes back from a mile and a quarter like like not even blowing hard i i for me Yes, 2020, there's going to be a lot of asterisks, and I suppose technically uh, there will be an asterisk to the achievement because it's different, but not one that's attached with any judgment, at least as far as I'm concerned. This horse, to me, has the potential to, to really be a, a, a great. To be, to be an all-time and to maybe end up across the street in the, in the <laughs> Hall of Fame here at, here at Saratoga. Well, I got, I'm going to put my, uh, my phony New York accent on because I got to ask you, obviously, the big question about Tis Luck. Hey, Pete, who can stop Tis the Law? <laughs> what do you think, man? Is there another horse out there that might challenge him? I mean, hey, what do you got for me? I don't have much, to be honest. I mean, the, the, there's, you know, the, the facile response would be a horse like Art Collector, who's looked terrific in, in doing his business as well, but not, I don't know, in terms of the, the specifics of the style and, and mostly the, this is the time that Tis the Law ran the last day in the Travers. Um, to run that fast, coming home geared down, it's just not something you see very often. And just given the hands he's in, I, I think it's gonna, look at this, this bee is really oh, very interested in pollinating my neighbor. Jonathan yep. Kitchen-like <laughs> shirt I'm wearing here today. Um, but he, he seems to have messed, gone, gone Hopefully off and done something be, else. Be gone. I mean, it's it sure right now looks like they're all running for second. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the draw, certainly gonna be interesting. You don't wanna be down in that number one post at, at Churchill Downs, it, it, that, that will, he might be good enough to overcome it, but that, that would be something that would make me think twice. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be much of a betting race for me this year. It might be more of a rooting race because I want this horse. I feel invested in this horse doing what I think he's capable of doing at this point. And we'll see. You know, we'll have, we'll have past performances. We recently did our Derby Draft show on the network, and folks had some clever ideas. But it's, uh, it may be a case where, where the first pick that went to our friend Naomi Tucker ends up being the, the <laughs> definitive one because it might be as simple as uh, tis the law to the hoop. Mm -hmm. There you go. And just a dominant, obviously dominant performance. And uh, I know uh, you didn't have a lot of betting uh, insider interest last week, I think, for the same reason, because of having such a heavy favorite. 
I will always eternally, I mean, you know, Rick and Ilse had Paris. I'll always have Javier is, you gotta introduce me to Javier sometime. I will be absolutely- We a, can make that happen. A fawning fan. You because, are a big fanboy I mean, of Javier. I mean, Catholic boy, it's my greatest day at the track, <laughs> is Catholic boy. But Caracara wasn't bad last week either to, to chat, well, if you say challenge, it was what, six and a half lengths or whatever it was, but ran very strong. Best of the rest, the best of the rest. That was a good yep. good pick by you. We talked about that actually at one of the, the Brentwood show the, the, the on the Wednesday before, another Naomi very good call was how interested she was in, in him as opposed to the one who'd beaten him the previous time, Country Grammar, and that, that proved correct. He's he's a, a good colt with upside, but I mean, when you see him get beat six, when you see that field get beat six lengths by a horse who was geared down and never looked like losing, it just, it's very hard for me to imagine anything that he's run against turning the tables. I guess hmm. the one horse I have in the back of my mind could be an improver at the mile and a quarter and maybe didn't show his best the last day with it being used as a pure prep, would be Honor AP. He wasn't impressive the last day, but you can tell I can tell myself a story why he might be able to improve and potentially be a, be a, a, a rival, but it, it could be a, a rivalry like the, the hammer and the nail. We shall see. Yeah, in, indeed, you could, that's one at least, uh, you know, paying attention there, folks, that you might be able to, uh, to make a case for. And uh, of course, this is something that bothers me across the uh, the whole spectrum of, of sports beat. When they question a champion about competition, now, I read some things in the last couple of weeks. You know, it's when they get to this whole who who did they beat? Well, you know, you've got no control over that. You know, I mean, you know, you win a World Series and you win a Super Bowl. Well, they didn't beat anybody. Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> gee, I didn't get to play against Bill Russell because he's <laughs> 83 years old right now. I mean, you know, shame on me, right? Michael Jordan or somebody or LeBron James. But in this case, competition. Was it not really, in your perspective, your informed perspective, was this not a deep three-year-old, you know, obviously pool of three-year-olds this year? Was it particularly just not a lot of depth there for him to be so dominant? Is that factored in? It's hard to it's hard to know. Uh, JK makes the point that it's much easier to evaluate the quality of these crops after the fact. The American yeah. Pharaoh faced plenty of that at the time. Yes. And then so many of those horses went on and kept winning grade one wins at, at four and it, you have a you have a different perspective. It doesn't seem like the, the strongest group we've seen, but the thing about racing and the thing that that sort of puts the lie, in my opinion, to that who did he the who did he beat crowd is that we run races and we time them, and yeah, they they, right. they give us a historical perspective that maybe other that maybe other sports. Um, I mean, I guess there's advanced metrics that might be the equivalent of that in other sports. You could look at you know baseball teams. Pythagorean win percentage or whatever, but you know I'm I'm a big believer in in the clock telling the tale. Mm. With Barrow, I thought it was a, a very interesting case that he had reasons to not have run, you know, quote unquote that fast through the Triple Crown, and then it was so satisfying as a fan, not just to see him win in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but to do so in a in a very fast time. Oh, yeah. And then with Tis the Law, he hadn't broken any clocks until. We got to the Travers, yep. but I think that uh, you know there he ran a giant 109 speed figure, and I think we'll see what, what ends up happening with the form of the race. But I mean he's he's now shown himself not just visually but also with the hard data of the clock that I I think it's an unfair I think it would be unfair to, to cast his achievements in the light of the rest of the crop. I, I think he's shown on his own that that he's a. a a serious runner and if he builds on it which he might that's when it's really going to get interesting i mean there's a lot it's early days really right you know in terms of trying to make a case for him as an all-time great that would be early right it, it's like but it, but you can see the you can see the path laid out before him and there's data to back it up and that's what's so exciting yeah, absolutely def no question that on his way if, if you can catch him which no one's been able to do fans no fans uh, obviously here at saratoga uh I mean, do you think it's just the devastation of, of tourism? You know, I'm coming into town yesterday uh, with my executive producer, Andy, and I said, my God, motel, $69 a night. I'm like, this is the height of the season. I mean, you know, it should have been a one or a two or a three in front of that. Yeah. Uh, just, but what, what's that dynamic been like for you, being around the town, activity, the downtown? I mean, there was a lot of activity downtown. And uh, I'm, can I give a shameless plug for where we were yesterday? Oh, please. They were going to come up later, but g well, give but, it to it and start now. I mean, They're friends. Yeah, absolutely. No, indeed. I know you're very good friends with the uh, new establishment with Walton Whitman, which is a great spot. 
uh, to somehow replicate what we normally have for events like Travers Day at the track. But what's that all been like for you? I mean, it's just kind of an eerie feeling to the whole atmosphere up here for you. It's been very, very strange, no doubt about it. And the people, some of the people, there's so many people feel bad for in all this. I mean, so many. But uh, I do think, in particular, of service industry friends and just how how much work has been has been taken away. And I feel like Saratoga's done a good job of having, you know, it, it's not a normal, I haven't been out much, but when you go out, it's not, you don't see the normal amount of people out, but you see some people out and places are coming up with creative solutions, putting the, the tables on the sidewalk, Walt Whitman inventing the outdoor patio, the, the reinvention of the, the Brentwood Bar. They did a fantastic job here. Not a ton of seats, but it, it's, it's super safe feeling and, and very comfortable and so I've just been trying to make the best of it. I've been working so much. I've worked much more this summer than maybe ever doing the, doing the, the tipping stuff I'm doing, these videos for Twinspires.com. Uh, JK's doing the ones for Del Mar. I'm doing the ones for Saratoga. That's a pretty big time commitment. And so a lot of the time that I would have been at the track anyway, I think what probably would have happened if the track had been open is I, I wouldn't be there for many full days it would be going over at the end after after right. work gets done it's just it's hard between all the stuff we have going on in the network which i'm not complaining is wonderful um doing the work with sky my sky sports work is picking up i'm going to be on the the saturdays and sundays i think pretty much the rest of the the rest of the meet so i'm so busy that i haven't really felt it but travers day i felt it that was very hard for me. I was like actively kind of a sad. Withdrawal. Yes, I was actively sad about what we didn't, what we weren't able to have. My birthday was a little bit like that too. Um, you know, we normally have the party and everything, and it just didn't. It just, I was gonna do it, and it just didn't. I just wasn't feeling it. Mm. I, 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 it. Uh, I mean, that was Travers Day as well. So it was really, I guess, that whole week just didn't feel. Uh, I felt a little off, but more, more often than not, we've been able to have some great days over here at the Brentwood drinking cocktails and eating pizza we've had some great fun at Walton Whitman some of the other places that have uh, setups to watch the races people are making the best of it and they're being creative and uh, you know that's that's what you just it's, it's just what we got to do we just got to grind grind along and, and you know Frank McGowie I think back at a pro punter who you you would really enjoy um, one of the most popular guests on the history of any show on the network that we've ever done and he, he visited us a couple times during the pandemic and just was like a, this like beacon of positivity when I really needed it. And it was just, you know, his refrain was, it is, you know, it, it's, it is basically, it is what it is, but, you know, we're going to get through it the way we've gotten through, you know, so many other hard things that we've all faced in our lives. And he's exactly right. And, and I think that's the idea is to just, um, you know, fortunately having so much work to do, that's a great distraction. Um, family and, and chances to hang with them we've had you know a lot of great time in that regard and and i'm just you know shoulder down and and you know shovel hmm. absolutely <laughs> and just uh, uh speaking for the uh, the chamber of commerce uh, I, I, a lot of people that knew i was coming up here this weekend that normally come up here from the boston area you know well oh, you're going to saratoga well the track's not open i'm going to give them a ringing endorsement and say go up enjoy it the town is still here you yeah. know and once again if you go to a place like walton whitman you can have a great experience and have that great, you know, bedding and track and set up and, and enjoy people and enjoy the whole experience. So, uh, you know, that's not going to be diminished. So hopefully people will do that over the next few weeks. And before we finish the shameless plug portion of the, of the podcast today, this is the place that I would recommend for people to stay because it's so... Yes, at the Brentwood. It's lovely. It's just distanced in a way that, like, no typical hotel can be. It's all contactless. Um, it's a, so, and there's no shared space. So it's right. it's uh, separate units. Yeah, I would yeah. I would highly recommend folks who want to come in and enjoy some Saratoga. You can get, you can, and we're having events every week. So I encourage folks to come, check one of those out, benefit the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, and just have some fun hanging out. Uh, and and we, we're hopefully going to get back you back here, if not during the meet, maybe yes. in in September to uh, to, to hang out a little bit more since, since you won't be on any uh, you won't be broadcasting football. Yeah, Apologies. Yeah, no, I was going to say yes. We have no Harvard football for me to uh, to broadcast. This How many year, years have maybe you? Maybe in the spring. What, what'll be the break for you? How many years have you done it? Well, it'd be 20, uh, 23 years of uh, doing the play-by-play -play voice of Harvard football, and it will be my first fall without a football team because of the work that I did with Boston University prior to that since nineteen eighty four. So the first time I haven't had a football gig since uh, it's been a minute 
Yeah, since Doug Flutie won the Heisman Trophy, I guess. You know, <laughs> look at it that way. It's about 30, 36 years. It's been a while. So uh, I can't, I can't yeah. help host sometimes. I have to ask while we have you on here. I'm sure a lot of listeners uh, uh -oh. m maybe haven't even put this together yet. But, of course, you're also the, uh, the voice of BU Hockey. What are, yes. we, what are we hearing about yeah. BU Hockey? Well, I think what we're hearing now, I think uh, best case scenario would be that hockey, uh, college hockey, would be back and uh, and up and running in January. I okay. don't see anything before Conference January. only, January type deal? It, it probably a conference only schedule. They'd have to modify that. The good news about the league that be used in with Hockey East is uh, is not a lot of distance to cover other than the outposts in Burlington, Vermont, and Orono, Maine. Other than that, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty local league in terms of being able to travel. So that's good. We're hopeful. We're hopeful that we can uh, we can get that back again. Uh, until then, uh, you know, the focus, as you mentioned, is with this little guy on the games people play. Yeah, let's guys. talk about that for yep. a minute. I want folks, I think there's a lot of people who listen to the shows on this network who would enjoy the work that you're doing. Give us the give us the lowdown on what games people play is and where they can find it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, we, we launched the podcast uh, back in June with my, uh, my partner in crime and uh, executive producer, Andy Bernstein. And uh, it's what I really love to do, which is, uh, you know, I try to bring back, uh, since he's gone now, the spirit of James Lipton. Uh, Larry King's still with us, but, uh, you know, those are a couple of inspirations for me. Uh, really trying to be the James Lipton of sports, if you will. And uh, we've been able to just sit people down and uh, former athletes that have a story, uh, allow them to tell their story in depth of their development and whatever they're on field or on court or on ice accomplishments were. But beyond that, uh, to a number of uh, compelling stories of what has become of them. In some cases, some of the people we've had so far, lesser known what's become of them, but no less compelling and intriguing. This is a cruel question that I didn't uh -oh. prep you for. If you had to pick a favorite show you've done so far, uh -oh. do, you have, do, you have a, do you have a stock answer? Do you have an answer ready for that? Well, Pete, of course, it's like my children. You really can't <laughs> uh, single out one show or one guest. I've really kind of adopted all of them. That's what I would have said. Well, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to say, uh, if people check it out, I, I will single out one. Uh, it is the so far the one female athlete that we've had on of the past uh, is Andrea Yeager. Sure. And, uh, people may remember Andrea, you know, typical of the game of tennis at that high level. Uh, she turned pro at, uh, she had just turned 15. Uh, you, suddenly she was competing with, and we talked about this, I mean, you know, athletes that were, you know, in some cases, you know, two decades older than her. I mean, she played Virginia Wade at Wimbledon. Oh, my God. 35, and she retired Billie Jean King at Wimbledon. Billie Jean King's last loss was the worst loss she ever suffered. To Andrea Yeager, Billie Jean was 39 years old. Oh, my God. She was 15, uh, but was contemporaries of Everett, Navratilova, Tracy Austin. And uh, at 20, she suffered a, soul, a shoulder injury. She had seven surgeries and retired. And since that time, and she's now, this is 35 years later, she has devoted all of her time, all of her efforts, and all of her money to philanthropy. Uh, she had uh, founded a uh, camp in Colorado for pediatric cancer patients, a Make-A-Wish camp. Uh, she now has a shining star. It's her, uh, her charitable organization, fundraising. And, and she, excuse me? It's the little star. The little star, the shining star. I don't know. I was channeling, you know, something. Do it in three notes there, right? Uh, yeah, shining star. Sorry. A little star foundation. And uh, she's just an extraordinary person. I mean, uh, and uh, we really enjoyed talking to her. She had a great experience. And uh, this is the type of experience we've been trying to give these athletes. I want them to be engaged, entertained, and enjoy it. This audience will want to hear a little bit about the Eddie Olchek appearance because I'm sure you almost had to get into a little bit of horse racing. Oh, we got into more than a little bit of horse racing, and once again, in, in my uh, you know my exhaustive preparation, I was able to uh, have a chance to uh, see him. What two appearances with you? I believe you've done a couple of appearances with you uh, on uh, great on, guests on, on, in the money, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, and Eddie, of course, uh, as you know, I mean, you talk about uh, a, a true Renaissance man, if you will, rock and tour. The fact that. The lead analyst with with Doc Emmerich on NBC's hockey coverage in the NHL, and he's also now elevated to the lead analyst for the Triple Crown of Racing for NBC. So uh, Eddie was uh, we had a lot of fun with Eddie, and of course, great common ground with uh, U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame already Eddie Olchek. That's awesome. Now, are you on uh, games people play? People can find it on iTunes. Yes, iTunes. Uh, I guess we're at uh, all of the uh, as they used to say about tickets on sale at all the usual outlets. I think we're on most of the usual outlets. 
uh, you know, we ask everybody, uh, games people play, you know, as they say, uh, just getting used to this. I'm about as well versed as Bill Belichick with Snap Face and <laughs> Chad Graham and everything. But, uh, you know, like us on Facebook, right? Andy, like us on Facebook. That's right, Bernie. <laughs> yes, follow us on Facebook, share us on Facebook. Uh, but uh, Do all the things. Uh, do all those things, Stitcher. you know. Uh, Stitcher. Uh, but uh, we right now we are uh, 11 shows YouTube also. Uh, it yeah, is that audio is important and video. to mention that there's a video element. A absolutely, and courtesy thus our of Andy. fancy uh, te high tech setup, setup high tech today. today. Uh, high tech, but still very low brand. Exactly, exactly. And uh, we're back on the ice this week. Uh, we have uh, Keith Kachuk. Oh, nice. Um, it was. I, I thought it was about time that I mean I've been meeting these people virtually and preparing and doing the interviews and making friends. But I said it's about time that, you know, I had somebody on the show that, you know, I've been drunk with in a strip club on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> so, thus, former Boston University Terrier Keith Kachuk. Oh, fantastic. Many know him. He was actually nicknamed by Eddie Olchek. Eddie Olchek gave him the nickname of Walt because of Walt Kachuk that played for the Rangers for 15 years yep. back in the 70s. But he has acquired another nickname now, Pete. What is it? Uh, his cousin, Andy Donahue, who played hockey at Diamond, nicknamed him Archie. Obviously. Oh, yes. With two, the sons. With two elite sons yes. in the NHL. <laughs> I mean, as I said to Keith, there's not too many guys. I guess they caught him on one of the uh, the NBCSN games, and he was at Matthew's game. You know, Matthew's still playing with Calgary. Uh, Ottawa's done, Brady's club. But I guess they caught him, and, you know, they get him on camera on the NBC coverage, and they, well, you know, there's, there's Keith Kachuk, you know, Matt's. And they caught him looking at his phone. And they said, uh, and I asked Keith, and he says, well, you know, it can get boring at times. He says, you know, you might turn over the puck and I might be, you know, upset with him or something or he's not on the power play. And I'll just put, put him on the phone and watch the other kid. <laughs> Only Archie Manning could relate to that story. You know, Eli just threw an interception. Uh, How, turn on how's the Indianapolis doing, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. So the kid's kind of relatable. But uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. And fingers crossed we can uh, take it to a higher level. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the level of you and uh, the platform that you're forged in a short period of time, which has been, uh, you know, exemplary. You're, you're too That's kind. You're too kind. The listeners should know that one of the first que one of the first conversations I had around the same time I, I was getting cold called by the likes of uh, Drew Coatney and, and Matt Miller trying to figure out what this new venture was going to be was a, a sit down, an in-person sit down with you sort of yep. coaching me through the, the radio model that you've used for years and really did become the basis for our, for our first season. I'm happy if there's any way you know, we can return the favor and, and help you get this going. I mean, your skills uh, as an interviewer, I, I may be dragging you down today, but generally speaking, no, your no, skills no. as an interview, very strong. Folks should definitely check out Games People Play wherever you get your podcasts. In, in, indeed. We did, we had that uh, summit meeting, uh, which I believe uh, we had chestnuts roasting on the open <laughs> fire. And we were not only listening to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but uh, an autographed copy because of your dad, which I was very yep. impressed yep. with. You know, yep. get a little verklempt over that one. But uh, thank you. And, uh, Peter, as we wrap up, we get back to the business at hand. I mean, there's, you know, people out there that got mortgages to pay, you know, <laughs> and kids to send to private school. So uh, I've often wanted to do this. My, my first opportunity ever. I can take this back to the NFL today in the 70s, you know, and I can be Brent for a minute and say, <laughs> all right, Greek, we got the 49ers at the Giants today. Who do you like? <laughs> what do you think today for the kind of right, you know, in the distance here at Saturday? Not too far in the distance here at the track. Yeah, we're right by the seven furlong shoot. That's not, that, was a, that wasn't a bad Brent. We might have to get you a gig on, on v -Sin. You are looking Im live. Im impersonating him at some point. We've got friends over there. We know people. We know people we know who know people. people. You know a lot of people. Let's talk late pick five. I'll just run down some stuff. The six race I wasn't that interested in um, as a betting affair, but I will probably just try to get something. We'll get something going late pick five wise. The numbers I was looking at, um, two horses that ran very close together last time, the four Brighthorn and the two lost in Rome. I gave some preference to Brighthorn, who I thought had a really weird trip, but they finished so close together. And that situation in a leg where I don't have a strong opinion I'd feel very silly if I lost to Lost in Rome. So I'll use the four and the two there. And then also the seven, striking speed, a horse that looks pretty ugly on paper, but dropping speed, good draw. I'll try to get out of that first leg, two, four, and seven. Now the seventh race, my opinion has changed a little bit since, um, since I wrote this and filmed this the other day for, for the Twinspires.com folks. And that's because... Um, and I haven't even watched the tape yet, but the 
this race that Lahara comes out of, a couple of horses have now come back to run and they haven't run well. And it, the figure came back very strong. So Lahara is going to be hammered and I will still use, but I'm much more interested, I think, as a value play at this point and maybe taking a shot with number seven Oak Hill in there who won very well in the maiden win. Hands of a patient trainer, should improve again. So I'll probably end up pressing number seven in race seven, backing up with the six, maybe backing up with the eight. But the seven has become my opinion in race seven. Race eight was another spreadier one for me. The numbers I was looking at were the six, Bertranda, just a consistent sort um, uh, who can be versatile in terms of running style. Then Big Q was a class dropper who I also thought would get a good trip and should improve again second off the layoff. And then there's an old class horse in here I want to use too who might get lost in the betting. Number three, JC's Shooting Star. If you go back, I mean, the JC's Shooting Star is probably equally good on turf and dirt. Definitely the kind of horse who needs to set up, but there's enough speed. If one of the top two don't do it, I could see JC's Shooting Star getting up in there. So I was going to play it 6, 11, and 3. Then I had a horse I really like in race 9, uh, one of these European shippers that I feel like I'm typically in tune with. Ricetta. Very interesting. Off the grade th uh, group 3 run, I should say, from York. York is a track that very often is uh, a good, offers good pointers for horses who will succeed here because they run left-handed and it's a lot of firm ground. Now, it's a, a more galloping configuration. It's not the tight turns of U.S. racing, but Ricetta... I just think fits. Would translate. Uh, it, it, yeah, I think yep. it should. I think it should translate. Re, I could say if we were getting if we were getting corny, I could say Richetta might have the recipe for success. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, <laughs> if I'm gonna back up there, it would probably be with the two and Ola Gay. But I'm gonna go largely through Richetta in race number nine, and then the tenth race felt spready again, and like maybe one we could get a price in. I liked Ink Splots, who was big prices with the bookies this morning. Uh, over it in the UK and Ireland, but this one I thought might end up being the best speed And I just felt like there's been excuses for the last two runs a bad break last time Just in too deep two races back I thought ink splots could rebound and then I was also gonna probably use Southern Brigade who has a number of angles dropping turf to dirt second off a layoff and then uh, dangerous edge had my my little pet trip angle of making a move into what I thought was a fast pace and I like the fact that I read Ortiz sticks around so looking at uh, six three and seven in the nightcap so those are the numbers I'm going to be messing around with hopefully uh, hopefully a few of those horses will win and, and folks can incorporate their own thoughts and uh, we can hit all these late picks today be sure to get in early on Southern Brigade with all the statues coming down <laughs> the Confederate generals anyway that's my only observation I did have but uh, Pete, uh, this was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I know that, uh, as usual, the, the, uh, the life of uh, Pete Fornatel, particularly here in Saratoga, is uh, nonstop. And uh, I know a big event uh, this afternoon, which we're going to have a chance. You're going to be there all afternoon. We'll have a chance to at least make a cameo. Yeah, I, honestly, if people are listening to this right away and you're in town, maybe call first to make sure, because we are limiting the numbers because of social distancing reasons, obviously. But we're going to be over at Taverna Novo. Uh, to benefit Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Basically, it's 50 bucks to come into the party and then cash, uh, food, and bar. I think the big oven's going to be lit up at about 4. There'll be uh, appetite, cold stuff uh, apps before that. But come and join, and if you can't join, we always encourage folks, you can always make a donation to our friends at the TRF. trfinc.org slash players is the URL. And keep your ears tuned. If you're in the area, if you're thinking for a reason to come to the area, I think we're going to do two or three more events. We'll, we'll sit and talk to Kim today about what the rest of our schedule is going to be. But we really appreciate the chance. I mean, it's just two things that we really need to be doing right now, supporting an important charitable endeavor and giving ourselves reasons and excuses to hang out and, to and see together. our friends. Yeah, yeah replicate absolutely. that camaraderie that we're, uh, we are a little bit robbed of by this rotten uh, year. Indeed the case. <laughs> <laughs> it's this rotten year that we're all ready to kick to the curb right now. It's only August, but uh, when's December 31st to bring in the new year and uh, turn the page here? Pete, thanks very much. It was great to have the opportunity to, uh, did we, we cover any everything? I mean, it was great to have the opportunity to join you, allow you, allow me to join you here today. I feel real good about it, man. I, I, I appreciate you 
and uh, and Andy and, and Tim for his production help. All our friends here, Michaela at the Brentwood, who does a great job. We encourage folks to check them out. Um, and, and we thank all of our partners. Our friends at TRF have gotten lots of love. Uh, Ten Strike Racing, that, that whole crew who we didn't get to see this year but have been part of what we've been trying to accomplish since the beginning and uh, you know most of all as ever we thank all the listeners and viewers yep. for uh, for tuning in and uh, do you want to do the close or should I do the close uh, well I was just gonna say an apologies to Matt Damon we did run out of time and uh, <laughs> I've always I've always wanted to say this I'm Mike Wallace <laughs> no wearing but you could be Ed Bradley anyway go ahead please. close it out get oh, me out of here good stuff give me the good look. stuff this show's been a production, a co-production of The Games People Play and In The Money Media. Our business manager over on the In The Money side is Drew Cotney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos! <laughs>